coming to this uh, side event. So, welcome to this uh, side event on the 37th session of the Human Council, organized by the coordination of the Association and the People for Freedom of Conscience, CAPLC. The topic is the denial of religious freedom in China, and more particularly, the anti cult persecution of the members of the Church of the Almighty God. I inform you that this conference will be recorded, then if someone does not agree, please let me know before starting. Thank you. You will be hearing from, from four speakers that I'm going to introduce. Our first speaker is Mr. Massimo Intrevin, director of CESNU, the Center of Study on New Religions, established in Italy in 1988 and recognized by the Italian administration as a non-for-profit association of special cultural value. It is a large international association of scholars specialized in the study of new religious movements. Its yearly international conference is the main academic event in this field. Second is Madame Christine Mir, Deputy Director of the CAPLC, a French NGO created in 2000 dedicated to the respect of the right of freedom of religion and belief. CAPLC is expert since now 20 years in religious minorities, discrimination in France and Europe. CAPLC organized events, conferences, meetings to unite minorities' religions to counter. She will develop the investigation report of the Human Rights Without Frontiers. Our third speaker is Madame Rosita Sorit, President of OLIR, the International Observatory of Religious Liberty of Refugees, is a newly 2017 created organization based in Torino, Italy, whose founder had a long experience in the field of religious based refugee claims. OLIR President Madame Rosita Sorit worked as a Lithuanian diplomat for 25 years and in 2012-2013 served as the chairperson of the European Union Working Group on Humanitarian Aid on behalf of the Lithuanian Pro Temper President of the EU. The fourth and last speaker is Mr. Ivan Arena Pelado. President of the Public Benefit Foundation for the Improvement of Life, Culture and Society, among other NGO, and founder of the Spanish Religious Freedom Awards, mentioned in the 2017 U.S. State Department Religious Freedom Report. Let's begin with our, our first speaker, Mr. Massimo Introvi, with Sinicization of Religion and Campaign Against Xinjiang in China, the case of the Church of the Almighty God. Mr. Intrabi, the floor is yours. Yes, I'm just waiting uh, for Pierre Ray to prepare my PowerPoint. In the meantime, there is some uh, academic material about the Church of Almighty God and uh, some other material you are welcome to take from the table. Yeah, the next one. In 2017, the Chinese president and other top Chinese leaders called for a further sinicization of religion in China and for a stronger fight against THR. I believe both words are important to understand the Chinese position on the religion and should be deconstructed beyond their literal meaning. The next one. Sinicization of religion means that religions should strictly follow the leadership and the aims of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. In other words, it's not enough that a religion has Chinese leaders or even has been founded in China. If they are not integrated into the system, they are not regarded as sinicide. Next one. Xie Jiao is a word which is often translated as evil cults or dangerous cults, but uh, these translations are misleading. The word Xie Jiao has been used in a Chinese official document since the late uh, the Ming Dynasty to indicate uh, heterodox teachings. 
And what teachings were heterodox was largely determined by the emperor. For instance, Christianity in its entirety was a CHL in the 18th century, but when China started to feel the, the pressure of the Western powers, Christianity went out of the CHL list in the 19th century. Next one. So uh, the policy of uh, Establishing a list of CHGL was not invented uh, by the communist regime. They inherited it from the empire and the republic, and they have continued uh, this policy of establishing lists of bad or evil religious organizations labeled as CHGL. So based on these two notions, cynicization and CHGL, in the Chinese law, there are three different groups of religious organizations. There are the fully sinicized religions. These are the five religions recognized by the government, including uh, for Catholics, the Association of Patriotic Catholics, and for Protestants, the unified three-cell church. Uh, then at the other extreme, you see below there are CHGL. Being active in a CHGL is actually a crime, Article 300 of Chinese Criminal Code, and the penalties from three to seven years uh, in jail or more. What is in the middle? In the middle there is a grey area of the not fully sinicized religions like the Catholic underground church or the Protestant house churches, they are not CGL. It's not a crime of being a member of them, but they survive in very difficult circumstances. Sometimes their churches can be closed or even destroyed. Other times their churches are more or less tolerated. The next one. Now, one new religion which has been in all the list of CHGL uh, uh, since 95, it was founded in 91, is the Church of Almighty God. What is the Church of Almighty God? It's the largest uh, new religion in China. It teaches that Jesus has returned, this time as a female, as a Chinese woman, and uh, uh, the, the words of Almighty God, uh, uh, collected in a book called The World Appears in the Flesh, announced the coming of a better war. Uh, the Church of Almighty God also believes that uh, communism is evil and that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is an embodiment of the great red dragon of the Christian Book of Revelation. And of course, this anti-communist attitude uh, explains a lot about uh, why the Church of Almighty God was almost immediately uh, classified as a CHGL in uh, China and made it into the list of uh, banned organizations. Next one. As I mentioned, in the, uh, the Church of Almighty God uh, uh, has been severely persecuted, 100,000 members have been uh, arrested. Uh, the church also uh, credibly claims that members have been tortured and some 30 have uh, died in custody in quite suspicious circumstances. It is a large movement, it's difficult to make statistics in contemporary China, Chinese government claims it has from 3 to 4 million members. Next one. The Chinese government also claims uh, that uh, the Church of Almighty God is rightly persecuted because it's responsible of various crimes. Uh, one of the most horrific crimes uh, attributed to the Church of Almighty God is the murder of a woman in a McDonald's diner in Zhaoshuan in 2014. Uh, however, and uh, you can find an article I wrote in a scholarly journal here on the table, studies by scholars have proved that the crime was committed by a different group, which also used the, the name Almighty God, but was not the same organization. Next one. Here I should mention in uh, 2017, I was invited uh, to China by the Chinese Anti-Cult Association, 
which is connected with the CCP, to participate in two conferences in Zhengzhou and Hong Kong uh, about the CHL and the Church of Almighty God. And the uh, local media here, you see an example, uh, say they came with a very open spirit with some colleagues, but, uh, and we are very thankful to the Chinese authorities for this invitation and for having shared with us a number of documents about the Church of Almighty God. But based on these documents, we concluded that many of the current accusations against the Church of Almighty God are actually not true. Either they refer to other groups or they are based on misunderstanding. The next one. So there can be no reasonable doubt that for the simple fact that you are a member of the Church of Almighty God in China, you can go to jail or worse. And this should also mean that those members of the Church of Almighty God who manage to go abroad should obtain a refugee status and be granted asylum because of religious persecution. Next one. Other people will talk about the refugee question, but personally, as a scholar of new religion, I regard as a scandal that in Korea and uh, in some European countries these applications for refugee status are denied because for me it's pretty much obvious that if you are a member of a CHL and uh, the Church of Almighty God has list, been listed as CHL in all lists since 1995, if you go back to China, you go to jail. So, that's the, the core definition of fear of persecution in international conventions about refugees. So for me, it's pretty obvious that if you are active in the Church of Almighty God, you should not be sent back to China. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nitrovin. So now I will give the floor to Madame Mir for the persecution of members of the Church of Almighty God in China. Human Rights Without Frontiers has been working to investigate and track the stories of Church of Almighty God members over the past year or so. We have been closely following their stories of their treatment made in China and their asylum processes in other countries. What we have discovered is that Church of Almighty God members who are denied refugee status and sent back to China face grave circumstances. The statistics from South Korea alone show that 178 members received a departure order after applying for refugee status. Of these 178 individuals, 17 were previously arrested or sentenced in China and upon their return have been targeted by Chinese authorities. 10 have been investigated and remain wanted by the CCP. 43 have been targeted by the CCP due to their relation with others who have been arrested. And 64 have been targeted due to their open activities <coughs> related to their church while they were in South Korea. These statistics paired with the testimonies of treatment upon return to China clearly display that the Church of Almighty God members face straightness and sometimes fatal situation in China, whether they are physically detained by authorities or not. To personalize and humanize these statistics, one must examine the testimonies and trends within their testimonies. The following case highlights three common characteristics of their circumstances for Church of Almighty God members in China. Those named in this case of the document are all alliances to protect the individual. The following case of Li Qiang illustrates the complication of being wanted and targeted by the CCP. According to the table above, the majority of those 
who were sent back to China from South Korea were targeted by authorities to burn their hotel. So the case of Li Yong. Five, two years old, Li Kyung, alias, a member of the Church of Almighty God from Xiong, Xinjiang City, Inan province, was arrested in December 2012 after proselytizing in Xi County with several other members of the church. The group was arrested and taken to the Xi County Public Security Bureau for questioning and fingerprinting. During this period, Li Guang was forced to point his finger to the Bible while being photographed. Li Qiang was ultimately detained for 15 days for illegal preaching and disturbing social order. On the morning of 15 July 2017, Li Xiang was listening to recorded sermons alone in his home when three police officers from the Xi County Public Security Bureau knocked at his door. Without an explanation or arrest warrant, they removed Li from his home and took him to the Xi County Public Security Bureau. There, Li Kuang was questioned about the whereabouts of another CAG member who he had been arrested with back in 2012. When Lee did not answer the questions regarding other church members, the police first stripped him, kicked him, and beat him with sticks and leather boots while he lay on the ground. The police did not succeed until Lee lay motionless on the ground. On 18 July, Li Guang was escorted back home by police officers. The police told Li that he was therefore required to report to the bureau every Monday and warned him if that was professing his religion, they would beat him to death. On 23 July 2017, Li was walking with his bike when two police officers jumped out of a parked car and rushed towards him. Lee decided to run. The police chased him for hours in a nearby wooden area. Due to injuries from his chase, Lee found medical help. The doctor suggested that he is in hospitalist, but Lee promised that if he was required to show his ID, the police could easily find him. On 27th July, Lee's uncle arrived at his house to check on him. He found him lying in bed with a blue face. It is reported that Lee was not in his usual mental state, that he was panic struck and paranoid, telling his uncle that the police were surrounding his house. Lee's family say that Lee was barely hitting and that he was spending the majority of his time painting back and forth repeating the word relax. In the morning of 5 August 2017, Lee Kwon was found dead in his bed by his mother. His family describes that the physical ailments and psychological scares he suffered due to being tortured and constantly chased by the police causes his death. Li Kuang is the only one of many who have been <coughs> subject to torture, surveillance, and targeting by the Chinese police. The mental strain that comes from the statue of being targeted is apparent. The Church of Almighty God members are unable to live in peace whether they are in custody or not. They live in constant fear and avoid situations in which they may have to identify themselves, including for medical treatment. Forcefully extracting three statements. Another frequent element that we have observed with incarceration of church Almighty members is forced repentance. The case of Pai 
Hong Kong. Bai Hong Kong was arrested in December 2012 in Xinjiang, Inan province, on charges of its using a evil cult organization to undermine law enforcement. While detained, Bai was beaten and subject to brainwashing programs that encouraged hate. Through the torture and brainwashing, the authorities were trying to get Bai to sign the three statements, the confession, the repentance, and the declaration of breaking of ties. Bai refused, resulting in repentance beatings and starvation. Bai suffered serious mental and physical injuries from the torture he experienced while in custody. He was finally released in December 2016. Five days after his release, his family sent him to get psychiatric help. To date, 47 years old, Bai has not been able to take care of himself and live independently. Now the case of Teng Yu. Zheng Yu was arrested in December 2012 for his belief in the Church of Almighty God. While detained, police tortured him, suspending him from handcuffs, beating him, and forcing him to do manual labor. Zheng Yu was asked to sign the three statements and also to write monthly sound reports. In one of these sound reports, Zheng Yu had written, <coughs> All positive things come from God, and all negative things come from Satan. After submitting this report, the guards beat him with high voltage electric batons. After his release, Zheng Yu sought medical care and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. There are many other cases like Bai Wonduan and Zheng Yu, in which torture and brainwashing is used for prisoners to sign the three statements. Church of Almighty God members, method of torture. For those who are arrested and held in custody, the Chinese police frequently use extreme methods of torture, as is apparent in the next case of Xiong Yun and Li Mei. Next slide, on 24 October 2016, two members of the Church of Almighty God from Kuku District in Yangsu province, 46 years old, Yang Yu and his wife, 47 years old, Li Mei, alias, were arrested by the Chinese police. At approximately 10 a.m., six officers forcefully entered the home of the couple and issued an arrest warrant for Yang and Li. The official charges stated that believing Almighty God is a violation of the state law and a disturbance of social security. The officers confiscated a laptop, tablet, and two cell phones from the house. They then proceeded to forcefully take Young and Lee to the Tang Kuang police station of the Kuku district in Nanjing City, where they were held in separate cells. Later that day, officers placed boots over the heads of the couple and took them by car to a nearby near <coughs> unknown location. It is now believed to have been the basement of the six imposter. Here, in this secret location, the couple were separated and interrogated by members of the National Security Group. Young was kept in a small room. He was forced to remain standing against the wall and was deprived of sleep. He received three meals per day. On the third day, young Negoci noticed a strange taste in his breakfast and immediately felt groggy. Soon after, his vision went blurry and he felt partially unconscious. Young Yoon went there interrogated by four policemen who asked him for information about the church. When he refused to respond, the police beat him. Over the following days, Young Yu continued to eat the food provided, but often suffered hallucinations, blue red visions, and uncontrolled vocalizations. 
The torture continued. He was beaten by officers and subjected to freezing temperatures. Young youth reports being forced to strip naked and stand in front of an air conditioner while guards stood by and loud. In a nearby room, Li Mei, young youth's wife, suffered a similar fate. For the first two days, she was forced to remain standing and was not allowed to sleep. She was repeatedly asked to question about the church. Following consumption of the food provided, Li Mei found herself unable to control her speech or actions, and if she were intoxicated. At one point, she reportedly exclaimed, Almighty God, which <coughs> resulted in officers beating her until she fell in conscience. For Li Mei, the beatings, hallucinations, and symptoms of intoxication continued until the 2nd of November. Li Mei's physical state deteriorated to the point that the National Security Group sought <coughs> medical help. After a visit to a Puku hospital, a doctor suggested that she be hospitalized. <coughs> the officer who had escorted her to the hospital denied her entry, seeming <coughs> for the reason that if she died, the detention center would deem it be responsible for her death. The medical report listed that Li Mei was suffering <coughs> from a lung infection, acute coronary syndrome, and acute muscular injury amongst <coughs> others. Li Mei's health further deteriorated without proper medical attention. Her condition was apparently life threatening and the officers decided to return her to the hospital. The medical staff, however, required the signature of a family member. The police therefore released both Yong Yoon and Li Mei. <coughs> the medical examination of Yong Yoon reportedly showed that he had injuries to his scapular ligaments <coughs> and broken bone, and general grazing and swelling throughout his body. <coughs> The couple reported that they had physically fully recovered in February 2017. They still, however, remained under the surveillance of authorities. Li Mei reports that her hospitalization resulted in a 3,800 RMB, approximately 485 UOP. The means of torture that the authorities in China have used against the Church of Almighty God members are particularly gruesome. The use of physical torture, deemed illegal in international law, has been widely documented among the cases we've collected. Human Rights Without Frontiers has detailed a number of cases such as this and has found that Church of Almighty God members in China have <coughs> several consequences for practicing their religion. Drawing conclusions, the following are some developing trends in treatment. Church of Almighty God members are arrested in vast numbers. Their charges, if any are even announced, are usually along the lines of and endangering social stability, subverting the government, or using a heavy cult to undetermine law enforcement. Those detained may be subjected to extreme forms of torture, including <coughs> forms of drugging, intoxication, violent interrogations regarding the church and or other members of the church, severe beatings, forced confessions, sleep deprivation, the use of torturous works in which the individual has to sit on a sharp surface, brainwashing programs, forced renouncement of faith, no internal investigation regarding allegation of torture against officers. <coughs> From our cases, we are also aware that arrest upon return is likely. 
We thank the three members of the Church of Almighty God who were arrested immediately upon their return to China from South Korea. Mr. Lee Then Yuan was arrested by police officers once he went through the security check at Yangji Airport in China on May uh, 2015. Mr. Hong Feng returned to China seeking medical treatment for his serious heart disease complications in March 2016. He had been monitored for two months before being arrested by the police in Hubei province when he showed his ID document during a standard procedure. He was detained and brainwashed for a span of two months before being released. Since his release, he remains under police surveillance. Mr. Yang Wu was immediately arrested by the Chinese police upon a return to China on the Church of Almighty God in South Korea on June 2017. We have collected the information of almost 400 arrested and imprisoned members of the Church of Almighty God in China. Unfortunately, based on our information, we can assume that the individuals who are denied asylum status and are returned to China will certainly face arrest and subsequent torture. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mir. So now I give the floor to Madame Rosita Sorin with refugee issues and the Church of Almighty God. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's good afternoon. I was checking on time, but it's time because it's good afternoon. Um, my presentation is um, was mostly destined to, for the for the member states because it's, I'm touching the, the issues, the arguments to prove to the member states that that uh, the members of Almighty God they have the right to be to be given asylum. Uh, but as we see the the. the Many meetings around, and uh, always it's very difficult to attract the attention of the member states. And uh, being a diplomat myself for 25 years, so I remember how difficult it is to attract the, the attention of the member states. But anyway, so my presentation is, it's, I would call it uh, nicely to be or not to be, uh, to give or not to give the, the, the right for asylum for the, for the members of the, of the Almighty God. And uh, my presentation is exactly to prove that yes, these people, they have the right to get the asylum. Can I have the first slide, please? Of course, my switching from the governmental side to the NGO side, the context in general for, for the refugees is very bad because we see all of us what is happening around the world and the, the very heavy um, discourse that is taken in many countries that refugees are bad and somehow they, they, they bring uh, some tensions to our countries and etc. So now to squeeze Another, another level of the refugees is, is quite difficult to convince the member states that they should do something with the people who are persecuted. Next slide, please. So the, the first of all is the, 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 the freedom of belief, because it's here is the, the, what is religion. That religion is, is normally is the very broad understanding what is the religion. And uh, I like always to talk about the, the freedom of belief. So it's whatever you believe. And you believe you have a, you believe in certain expression of, of some religion, or you believe in, in that there is no God, you are atheist. Your 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 freedom to express yourself and to believe in what you believe is, is your right. And the universal uh, declaration of human rights is exactly something that is 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 providing this guarantee, and member states, they should implement it. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So, and then if people, they, they don't have the right to really to express themselves freely, and in particular, if there is a, a, a serious grounds of suspicion that people might be persecuted, so then, and they flee their country, so the, the, the states, when they ask for the, for the help of protection, they should protect them. 
And um, and for instance, in the case that we already heard the, the presentation of two of two presenters this morning, is exactly the, the proof that there are the, the clear ground for the people to seek the asylum. Because first, they cannot freely uh, express their religious beliefs. Uh, they are persecuted. We had we had the, the numerous cases of the of the of the people who really severely persecuted. So, and in this case, there is clear ground for them if they flee their country to seek for the asylum. So the question is how strong the, the, the persecution should be. And that's what the, 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 the normally the international documents, that's what they say, that if private practice of religion at home is allowed, but public worship or missionary activities are punished, UN and European guidelines still recognize the presence of the persecution. And we have a specific case in 2013, from, sorry, uh, where the Court of Justice of the European Union took the decision about the Ahmadis. That if Ahmadis cannot really worship in the open their, their religion, so they should be given as I can, can next. The, certainly, we understand that there is there is a big challenge for the for the for the member states to recognize because it's the, the, the really the, the you saw you see every day on the on the news how many people they are flee, fleeing in particular Europe lately or, or they try to get to other countries and all of them they claim that they, they have the right to be refugees so for the member states it's very it's very important to really distinguish who is who. And uh, if people they have the right, so it's, they should they should get the protection. So and uh, the the fact is that some of the of the migrants who don't have the right for the for the asylum, and uh, and they are illegally immigrating into the countries. So they try sometimes to simulate their religious identity. So for instance, they say that uh, they. Uh, uh, they converted, uh, they arrived in the country being uh, Muslim from a Muslim country, but then suddenly they decided to convert uh, in a European country and they say now they are Christian and if they go home they will be persecuted. So in these cases, so it's normal that they are not granted the, the, the asylum. It's because it's, it's, we don't know how sincere the, the conversion was and etc. So you have this, this kind of, of things that, that, that the government they should take in mind. And as you see, because there is a very, very important document, is the 2004 UNHCR guidelines, which give the very often they give the explanation to the member states, to guide the member states in the many different aspects of the of these very tricky issues. And uh, and these guidelines they recognize the problem of the, what to do with the people who are uh, who are converting in, in place. So, but, but they advise that every case should be examined individual, individually for credibility, but without placing excessive burden on the asyl asylum <coughs> seeker. So, but in the in the case of the of the of the Church of Almighty God, it is it's not even it's not even the, the relevant uh, the relevant concern, because the people already they, they they arrived they left their country and they arrived to the to the host country. And they already they they they, have, they, have, they emigrate or they leave their country because because there is a clear persecution. Next slide. So and uh, as we saw as we saw from the from the from the previous presentations, in the case of the of the Church of Almighty God, is already the, the is in the law. So it's it's not you don't need really look very far away trying to find the proofs if these people are persecuted. If you have the law, as, as Professor Introvini mentioned, if you have the list and the, and the, the Church of Almighty God is clearly cited in the list as the one of the most uh, dangerous, uh, evil cults uh, perceived by the Chinese government, so there is a clear ground that these people, they are persecuted. So meaning that this, you don't need much more to have much more proofs for that. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, the reality is that uh, the situation of the of the members of, of the Church of Almighty God, 
uh, trying to get the asylum in, in, member, in many countries is very difficult. So it's only in few countries that they are more or less easily, easily or on time given, given the right to stay. It's US and it's Canada. So they struggle very much in many European countries. So some countries they are easy and you see by the pattern by, by in, in other cases also that, uh, for instance, the country like, like Sweden, so they are more understandable. So because they know that the, all the tricky aspects of the, of, the, of the situation of people who seek the refugee status. But let's say the, the country like Italy or France, uh, it's very difficult. So it's out of the, in, in, in Italy, out of 600 uh, people who applied for asylum, just few people they were given, right? In France, again, it is like out of the of some hundred people, just few people they they, they receive the, the, the status. So the rest, and that is the dangerous, very dangerous part. The rest the risk, because when you are you you are refused the asylum, so then you should go home, and going home it means that that you you most probably you will be taken into custody and nobody knows what will happen to these people and that is in particular, in particular a difficult situation because there are quite uh, serious ground for the suspicion that people might be tortured and that is, is very dangerous and if we read the international documents uh, such as the, the international refugee law or humanitarian law so you, you, you have the, the principle of non refugee law so when you really, when a country really refuses or even de deports uh, people, they should be very, very sure that these people will not be persecuted or tortured. And in the case of the members of Almighty God, of the Church of Almighty God, it's clearly there is a risk that they might be, and we have even the, the, the facts, because even we, myself, I met people who were later, they were, they were deported, for instance, in Korea and in South Korea, so, and we don't know what happened to these people. So, and that is, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous breach of international law. Uh, next slide. And uh, now we're just coming back because the, the most difficult country so far for the, for the, for the, for the refugees of, uh, of the Church of Almighty God is, is the South Korea. Because so far, the, the, nobody got the, the protection. And not only they got the protection, but they had the... I'm not... I should say that myself, I cannot be very sure if they were deported or people they just left because they, they received the order to leave. Because sometimes you receive the order to leave that you stay. But, uh, but some people in South Korea, they, they, they were forced to leave and they left. And as I mentioned, so they, nobody knows what really happened to them. They don't have the news anymore. So, and, uh, and it, now it's, I'm coming a little bit like to the conclusion that as you see that for the, for the, there are very, there are many uh, arguments that, arguments proving that uh, the, the, the members of Almighty, the Church of Almighty God, they have the right to get the, the, the refugee status. Because there are five principles uh, which are mentioned in the, in the 2004 UNHCR guidelines given to the member states. And the guideline, one of the guidelines is that all beliefs are protected. That beliefs about religion are eligible for protection. So if you are persecuted because of your beliefs, so you have the right to be, to be, to be protected. And uh, as you saw from, from my arguments and the, the previous speaker's arguments, it's clearly that there is a gap for the, for the serious concerns and need for protection. Next slide, please. So sometimes <coughs> the, the, in the process of, um, of uh, for the judges or the, or the commissions who take the decisions uh, to grant or not to grant a asylum, sometimes the argument is that uh, that they, they try, uh, they say that, that uh, they try to question people and to see if they are very skillful in knowing the, 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 the finest elements of, the, of their religion. And uh, the, the guidelines, they say, that it's not necessary that individual believers 
prove that they are very fervent or particular acknowledgement in the religion. Being a member of the persecuted religion is enough. And there is even even um, even worse situation that sometimes the interpretation that uh, of the religion that that, for instance, the judges they have uh, they have from the from the internet is something that is not entirely what what the, the believers how believers they see the the, the certain aspects. So we will not go into theology because I'm not very good at that. But that also is sometimes this confusion is really is the reason why the people were rejected because somehow it's not believed that they really they are the members of this church and that is, is also very dangerous. Next slide, please. Um, so it's the, the and the challenge is as, as I already mentioned a few times that the challenge is to prove that, that these people they are not seeking the, they are not uh, economical migrants. That, and usually it's really they come with the means and etc. So they don't really flee their countries to, just because they need a better better life, but they flee because they need the protection. So and the next slides. So and uh, and certainly when when there are uh, suspicions of persecution. So that uh, that is really a serious ground for the for the for serious consideration of every single case. So and uh, and the guidelines that they, they say that it's not necessary to prove that the asylum seeker has been personally persecuted. That is very important. But if the group is persecuted, it's already there is a ground for their protection. And the next one, the last one. So and um, and that is a very sensitive uh, sensitive aspect, which was mentioned in the presentation of the of the professor Intervenia, is that when sometimes the, the, the persecutors they cannot uh, get uh, to the members of certain of certain uh, groups or religions, so sometimes they just accuse them of the common crime. And we have many cases in, in Europe and around the world, and it's like, uh, if uh, you cannot accuse, uh, let's say, Scientology of, uh, of other things, so you accuse them of not paying taxes in Russia, for instance. Or you accuse the Jehovah's Witnesses, they are extremists, somehow extremist group, which is very difficult to prove. So when you accuse, or you accuse that electricity is not pro working properly in, uh, in in Hungary for Scientology, and you cannot uh, and Scientology cannot operate. So it's, there are many cases, and uh, specifically in the case of the of the Church of Almighty God, it was mentioned already the case of the of the murder in McDonald's, but uh, is uh, is like is very. Uh, largely publicized the case, but nobody is really saying clearly that it was clearly established that people from the it was a different group who committed crime and not the specific group. But that is not somehow in the mirror. And the, the information that we get uh, from the from the web usually you, it makes you confused and you don't know what exactly it is. So, so I believe that it was convincing enough that. Uh, that there are not really, we don't really, really need more of elements to, to have for the member states to really to find the, the, the arguments to reject them. And instead of, uh, of, um, of giving the, the, the refugee status. So, and it's very sad that so far, so people, they are struggling and uh, they live very uncertain life because they never know when the rejection might come, and uh, and what will happen to them? So it's uh, because I, I interviewed many people from from this uh, from this group, and people they live a horrible life because they don't know when they will be rejected, they will be accepted, they will be forced to leave. What will happen to them? What will happen to their families and etc. So I believe that is the the question that should be really known to the large public, and, and unfortunately that today the 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 snow was not really very conductive, so that we hope that slowly this issue will be more and more known. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to your last speaker, Stephen Van Afrika.
So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deval, for, for the opportunity to share uh, the floor with uh, so incredible fighters for freedom. It's, it's really an honor to, to be part of this, this table and, and participate in this event of the coordination of associations and people for freedom of conscience. And uh, I'm going to to read a report written by uh, Mr. Eric Wu from the European International Religious Forum for Religious Freedom, based focused on the case of the refugee status of members of the Church of Almighty God in France. And I hope I can represent him well enough. The difficulties that the members of the Church of Almighty God face with respect to their asylum request in France are not very different from those they encounter in other European countries. Nevertheless, we will list the main, and in my opinion, they are wrong, uh, the wrong reasons for which an overwhelming percentage of requests have been denied in France for the members of the Church of Almighty God. I will explain briefly why and how France could improve its vision of the members of the Church of Almighty God as well as its knowledge of this church, review its decision and grant asylum to the genuine refugees. As a note, this is not uh, an attack on France, this is not an attack on Europe, this is not even an attack on China. It's basically a dialogue on how things should be based on the current law of different countries and international laws. So first point, Several cases show a confusion between the movements called house churches and the ones which are included in China in the official list of Xi Jiao, which has already been explained, the so-called evil cults, or more exactly, unorthodox teachings. While the first ones are not systematically persecuted, the last ones are without doubt a constant target of persecution by the Chinese authorities. And this is inscribed in the very provisions of the Chinese Criminal Code, as Mr. Mr. Introvino already mentioned. Because of this confusion, French courts have argued several times that there is no systematic persecution based on the incorrect presupposition that the Church of Almighty God is one of the house churches, and it's ignoring its presence on the list of the evil courts. However, a few recent decisions in France have finally recognized that a systematic persecution actually exists in China against the members of the Church of Almighty God. Second point, most of the conclusions of the French courts are based on a document published by the, what is called the DIDR, which is the Division of Information, Documentation and Research. The Division of the OPRA, which is the French office for the protection of refugees and stateless, and is in charge of gathering information to support this uh, French Office of Protection of Refugees agents in their decision-making process. This document has been compiled on the basis of sources available on the internet until a few years ago, and these were mostly documents emanating from or influenced by the propaganda of Chinese anti cults We all know here how uh, the internet can be used for the good and for the bad, and how misinformation can be spread about anybody and about anything. These this decisions contain numerous errors that give a wrong picture of the church, its doctrine, its social positions, etc. Recently, four well-known religious scholars have written to the DIDR in order to offer correct data on the movement and tackling one by one the errors contained in the DIDR document. The DIDR has not answered yet, but it is clear that these independent expert opinions should completely change the way French authorities take their decisions concerning the asylum seekers from the Church of the Almighty God. So third point. The same happens with three documents on the Church of Almighty God, which were published by the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada in 2013 and 2004, 
on the basis of the information available in these years before there was any uh, scholarly studies done in regards to this church and that before they were being published. These documents are regarded as authoritative in France. Again, recently, the same four religious scholars have written an expert opinion that has been sent to the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, giving updated and more accurate data of the Church of Almighty God and asking that the old documents be corrected. Paradoxically, while often quoted in France, the Canadian documents are almost never quoted in decisions rendered in Canada about the asylum seekers of the Church of Almighty God, whose application have been accepted in a large majority of the cases, talking about Canada. As a fourth point, based on these different documents, several French negative decisions concluded incorrectly that some asylum seekers were not really members of the Church of Almighty God. This, this ties in with one of the points you were mentioning, like why do you have to prove that you know all of the doctrines of a church to be able to, to get asylum, right? I mean, a believer can be a new believer. Uh, it doesn't mean being a new believer doesn't mean that you're not a true believer, right? So, because their answer about the church during interviews didn't fit exactly with the content that they had in the documents, the, the French authorities and the Canadian documents. So having reviewed the answer that led to these wrong conclusions, it appears, uh, and also to the experts who have studied in depth doctrine of the church, that the asylum seekers presented the church correctly, while the French authorities instead, they were comparing to wrong information about the actual beliefs and doctrines of the Church of Almighty God. To give you an example, one could consider that the fact that a member didn't know anything about a supposed apocalyptic prediction for 21st December 2012 was astonishing, and that proved that this was a pretended member of the Church, meaning not a genuine one. However, the truth, the fact, is that the Church of Almighty God as an organization, as a movement, has never promoted such a prediction and never considered this part of its doctrine. Even scholars who have no sympathy at all for the Church of Almighty God have, have shown, have recognized the fact and mentioned that members of the Church of Almighty God do not believe on, on, this, on this prophecy. And that the actual, some members of this church who were believing on this because associating it with the Maya beliefs of the, on the end of the world, uh, they, they, were, they were corrected by, by the authorities of the church because these are not real doctrines, these are not the teachings of the Church of Almighty God. And when they were not wanting to be corrected, then these members were being expelled because they were not following the doctrine. As a fifth point, French authorities consider in several decisions that the fact that members were able to escape from China, sometimes with the help of officers who granted them valid passports, was a proof that there was no persecution. Come on, we all know about corruption. We all know corruption can be found in every country. Sometimes people have used corruption to escape persecution. This is one of the facts. This opinion that uh, because they escaped, there cannot be persecution because they managed to do that, this shows that they don't really know, these authorities, they don't really know the, the Chinese society. It stems from ra real lack of knowledge in the Chinese society. A recent expert opinion by an Italian professor of sociology, Professor Pierluigi Socatelli, who has studied both Chinese religious movements and Chinese immigration into Europe explain very well how Chinese immigrants can easily take advantage of the flaws of Chinese system and sometimes of the corruption prevailing in China to get proper passports, even when theoretically they should not be able to get them. There's a sixth point before I finish. Some decisions in France were recognizing the existing persecution targeting the Church of Sol of Almighty God in China 
consider that the individual asylum seeker could not prove that she or he was a prominent member with a specific position inside the church. Again, we go back to one of the five points that have to be taken into consideration when granting a refugee status. Of course, this argument is narrow-minded. The Chinese criminal code, as commonly interpreted by the courts in China, is quite clear that the mere fact of being active in a Xi Jiao group, the so-called dangerous groups, dangerous groups, is a crime which is punished with jail penalty without distinguishing whether the member occupies a specific position or is just a common devotee. So the risk of persecution, as well as the fear of being persecuted, as requested by UN United Nations standards to obtain the status of refugee, exist even if the members who do not occupy a specific position in the church are the ones asking for it. As mentioned earlier, a few decisions from the French National Court of Asylum Seekers have recognized, finally, the systematic persecution of the members of the Church of Almighty God. This is a good evolution that, if confirmed by subsequent case law, will open the door to many more fair decisions regarding the asylum seekers of the Church of Almighty God, but also of any other religious movement who may face a similar situation. In the last year, the production of academic literature of the Church of Almighty God has considerably increased. Many reliable documents have been produced, and for the first time ever, it is possible to really understand the doctrine of this peculiar Christian Church, as well as the challenges that it's facing regarding its persecution in China. It is therefore of the most importance that the French authorities and any other authority in the European Union specifically, or around the world, uh, take, take knowledge of how to actually protect individuals. Because as I saw on one of your slides, uh, refugees, people escaping from religious persecution, they are human beings. Sometimes authorities forget that they are dealing with human beings. And they believe is to detach themselves from 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 the emotions, they, they, they deal with people as if they were numbers. Right? So we have to insist on humanizing all these laws. These laws are not for robots. These laws are for human beings. So what is at stake right now, it is not a minor issue. What is at stake is the safety of persecuted human beings and of the members of this church specifically in this case, which we are dealing in this side event at the United Nations. But it is a matter of life or death. Sending back to China members of the Church of Almighty God today, it equals to being a complice of the persecution that they will have to suffer. While it is understandable that errors occur when there is a lack of data available to take proper decisions, this excuse does not anymore exist today. Reliable data exist, they are available, and they must be studied carefully and taken into account by the French authorities and any other authorities receiving such applications. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, the, for this conclusion. And before to have, we have a video. in order to force me to divulge information about the church. Three policemen viciously flogged me with a whip on the face, neck, and chest. They even said killing people like you who believe in God is no big deal. I was beaten beyond recognition and 
could not take care of myself. And... Even going to the toilet required other prisoners to transport me. Ten days later, my landlord found a copy of the word of Almighty God. The word appears in the flesh, in my rental house, and handed it over to the police. I was interrogated again. Walking into the interrogation room, I heard the criminal police captain say, Give me six days. I assure you the interrogation will bear fruit. Afterwards, the criminal police captain found numerous photos of brothers and sisters from the computer to let me identify. I refused. A young policeman grabbed my hair and swung me around against the floor. He followed by abruptly throwing me on the floor and kicking me fiercely on the waist. Then they restrained me with a pair of chain handcuffs and made me squat while holding both arms up horizontally. They burned my wrists with cigarette butts as they teased me. So much fun. It sizzles like barbecue. It was so painful that my heart was about to pop out. Seeing how they relished in torturing me, I was so angry. I thought, don't you people have mothers? How could you be so cruel to a believer in God? Seeing that I still wouldn't speak, they stomped on my feet with the heels of their leather shoes. The second and third toes of my left foot were fractured. I broke into cold sweats and bit my lips until they bled. Then the policeman pulled me up and rammed his knee on the left side of my femoral head. He gnawed his teeth and said, Tell you, this is the ultimate trick. It damages the bones without damaging the skin. No one could detect it after you are crippled. It made my femoral head collapse. As a result, I could neither stand up nor walk. The next day, my entire left leg turned purple. It was so painful that I could not sleep all night long. Even now, I could not exert my left leg. The next day, seeing that I still would not tell him anything, the policeman said he would give me an injection to make me spill out the church's affairs in an unconscious state. Worried that I might implicate other brothers and sisters, I bit hard on my tongue until it bled. All at once, blood splashed into my mouth. My tongue started to swell and pressed up against my palate. The policeman did not give me an injection when he saw that I could not speak. In the evening, when the two policemen guarding me fell asleep, I planned to open the window and jump off the building to end my life. I was crippled after two days of torture. If they proceeded with the torture for four more days, I would be the dead meat in their hands. I tried several times but failed to get on my feet. Now that I didn't even have the strength to die, I was more reluctant to live. It made me feel even more melancholic and helpless. At this moment, I thought of Almighty God's word. Thus, during these last days, you must bear testimony to God. No matter how great your suffering, you should go on to the very end. And even at your last breath, still you must be faithful to God and at the mercy of God. Only this is truly loving God, and only this is the strong and resounding testimony. At the critical moment, it was God's word that sustained me and gave me confidence and courage to live on. The third day, the criminal police captain tied a wooden pole behind the square stool I was sitting on. He grabbed my arms forcefully and twisted them backward, fastening my hands on the pole behind with my body hanging from it. My left arm snapped instantly. The pain made me break into sweats. He hooded me with a black plastic bag and struck my head repeatedly with a hard object. I felt something warm flow down from my head and soon passed out. When I came to, I saw myself lying on the floor, my hair soiled with blood. There were blood stains all over my face, my body, and the floor. Later, I was sent back to the Hunchen Detention Center. At the same time, I was completely unable to take care of myself. Since I believed in God and was a political prisoner, the police didn't give me medication for treatment. My physical conditions were worsening. In September 2005, I was sentenced to one year of re-education through labor. Due to my serious conditions, it was amended to supervised release when my supervised release was over, 
the police ordered me not to believe in Almighty God and preach the gospel anymore, saying, if you are caught again, you will be sentenced severely. In order to evade a second arrest by the CCP, I embarked on a life in exile again. The brutal torture of the CCP has brought me serious injuries. My memory has obviously deteriorated. I was left with multiple disabilities. I am only capable of some simple labor and almost reduced to an invalid. In fear of the CCP's arrest, I had not dared to contact my family. Assuming that I had died, my husband started a new family. In 2013, I fled to South Korea to seek asylum. By the end of August, a friend from my hometown told me, on August 20th, four policemen went to my house to arrest me. They said to my ex-husband, if we seize her, she will be sentenced to life imprisonment. In January 2016, my daughter in South Korea received a telephone call from her father, saying that several policemen had once again approached him and said, your ex-wife is good for a sentence to life in prison. If she returns, she will be arrested as soon as she gets off the plane. I was shocked when I heard the news. The persecution of the CCP government has reduced me to the state of homelessness and vagabondage. Now that I have fled overseas, the CCP government still has not ceased persecuting and hunting me down. In China, there are tens of thousands of Christians like me who are being persecuted by the CCP. They are homeless and confronted with threats of arrest, imprisonment, and even death at any time. I hope more human rights organizations and righteous people will pay attention to the fact of the Church of Almighty God being persecuted and denounce the CCP for its persecution of religious beliefs. Thank you. At the end of July of 2002, the two leaders of our church who had been staying at my home for a long time were arrested by the CCP police under brutal torture. One of them disclosed the fact of my belief in Almighty God in an unconscious state. Upon hearing the news, I had to flee my home to evade the CCP's arrest. After leaving home, I heard that agents of the National Security Bureau in Chengcheng City had been going to my house every three or five days. They took my wife away and interrogated her repeatedly concerning my whereabouts. They even monitored my telephone line and placed my house under surveillance by several undercover policemen. After relocating several times, my wife was still unable to rid herself of the CCP police's tracking. My brother-in-law was arrested and badly beaten up by policemen of the city's National Security Bureau after being tracked for a month because he was commuting to work in my car. A month later, he was released when the police determined that they had arrested the wrong person. In September 2003, when my younger brother risked inquiring about a situation in my hometown, he was arrested and escorted by the police to the National Security Bureau in Changchung for interrogation. The police tortured and forced him to tell them the whereabouts of me and other brothers and sisters of the church. They even said, we know about everything your elder brother had done. Your brother printed. So many religious books, 
that we don't even have enough room to keep them in the building. Your brother is a key figure of the church. He will be sentenced directly upon arrest. Later, my younger brother was unlawfully detained for 15 days. Because I was on the run, my mother was implicated and she was also forced to flee. Then in 2006, I got to see my mother with the help of a brother. She had aged quite a bit. I held her hands and suddenly saw that there were a lot of cracks in the skin. So I asked her what had happened. She told me that because she was being persecuted and was afraid of being arrested, she didn't dare go to the market to buy vegetables. She had to go scavenge from other people's fields that had already been harvested. And she also gathered firewood to make fires to cook over. I was shocked to hear about her situation. My mother suffered all kinds of hardships to raise me and my two siblings. It really wasn't easy for her. From the time I was little, I wanted to make sure my mother could have a wonderful life. Seeing her like that, she said that after I ran, she was constantly afraid for my safety. And that kind of life resulted in all kinds of health problems for her. Hyperthyroidism, bronchitis, and facial paralysis. Seeing that made me terribly upset. I felt that I should have been filial to her during that time. And I wanted so much to help her with that labor. But because of the persecution of the Chinese government, I couldn't show her even that little bit of filial piety. All I could do was leave with haste. In February 2012, after spending 10 years in exile, I secretly returned to Changchun to look for my wife. She said, after I left, the city's National Security Bureau often summoned my wife for interrogation, forcing her to disclose my whereabouts. My wife almost collapsed mentally. She was always muttering about wanting to commit suicide. Unable to work for nearly six months, she was persuaded to resign due to sickness by the hospital in order to break away from the harassment of the CCP police. My wife submitted to the court a declaration of my death, followed by posting an announcement in the newspaper. She remarried later. My original happy family was destroyed by the CCP just like that. Since the CCP was still investigating my whereabouts, I had to remain on the run. For more than 10 years in flight, two-thirds of the brothers and sisters around me had been arrested just for believing in God, preaching the gospel, or printing religious books. Some of them were killed, others were crippled, or sentenced to prison for five, seven, or 12 years. Some of them have disappeared, and no one knows whether they're still alive or not. On several occasions, I barely made a harrowing escape under the nose of the police. It is too dangerous to believe in God in China. In June 2013, I booked a flight and prepared to flee to South Korea. On June 22nd at about 10 a.m., when I was resting at the house of a host family where I was temporarily lodging, more than 10 policemen suddenly broke in and raided the place. I escaped when they searched the objects without noticing me. I later learned that the rest of the five Christians in the house were all arrested. Two months later, under the cover of other Christians of our church, I fled to South Korea to seek refuge. For more than 10 years, the CCP had been hunting for me. I had to flee overseas because there was no place for me to take shelter in China. 
During that time, I was spending money to find connections everywhere to obtain a passport. After a roundabout path, I was lucky enough to escape from China. However, most Christians of the Church of Almighty God and also of other churches in China are unable to flee because they are closely watched by the CCP. It may be very difficult for them to obtain a passport. Some were arrested in the risky process of applying for a passport. In mainland China today, Christians of the Church of Almighty God are still being brutally suppressed and persecuted by the CCP. Here I call on the international community to pay attention to the CCP's persecution of CAG Christians and to help more persecuted Christians in mainland China gain freedom. Thank you. My name is Zhen Xin. I am 38 years old. I joined the Church of Almighty God in 1997. I was arrested and tortured for a month and a half by the Chinese police for believing in Almighty God. I had been sentenced to re-education through labor for two years. After being released from prison in 2010, I was still being investigated and pursued by the CCP government. I was forced to live in exile for years. The following is my detailed statement. On July 31st, 2008, while doing church work, I and two sisters of the church were arrested by the police of the Jixi City Public Security Bureau in Heilongjiang Province, China. I learned from the police's word that they had been monitoring and tracking me for six months. The police said that it was unlawful to believe in Almighty God, and I was a target for crackdown and arrest by the state. They even snatched away 100,000 RMB that the church was going to use for producing gospel DVDs. At the Public Security Bureau, two policemen coerced me to tell them the whereabouts of the church money and other brothers and sisters. I kept silent. They fiercely slapped my face, punched my head and face with their fists, grabbed my hair and swung me around on the floor, kicked me in the stomach, and severely pinched the pressure points between my index and middle fingers. They also forced me to fly the plane, that is, extending both arms forward horizontally while holding a half-squat position. When I couldn't hold it any longer, they would beat me. I was tortured like this from noon to eight o'clock at night. The beating made my head numb, my lips pout, and my body swell all over. The pain was excruciating. The police continued to interrogate me. When I kept silent, he acted in a crazy way, picked up a mop to rain blows on me with a wooden handle. I was hit hard on the head several times. The wooden handle broke into three pieces. I was knocked unconscious. The police woke me by splashing cold water on me. Then they lashed my swollen arm with a broomstick. It was not until two o'clock in the morning that they stopped out of tiredness. I was lying motionless on the floor, feeling weak in my heart. Thinking about the unknown torture I still had to face the next day, a wave of fear swept through me. I could only pray to God over and over in my heart. When I went to the toilet the next morning, I discovered that I was unable to stand on my feet. I could only move forward slowly by leaning against the wall. In the toilet, I touched my skull. The top of it felt soft. There seemed to be some fluid trapped inside that was moving in my forehead and face. I saw bruises over my body, muscle knots over my left leg. The muscles on my arms and thighs were tight like drums. It hurt so much that I couldn't touch my limbs. I realized that my injuries were serious. In the afternoon, a policeman shocked me with a high voltage electric baton and punched and kicked me. I felt numbness and pain all over my body. I was lying on the floor and almost unable to move. I smelled the fine hair on my arms burn. 
The police forcefully kicked me and shouted, by the order of the state, killing you people who believe in God does not count as killing. Our Communist Party is in power today. We want to fix a date for you with death. They tortured me until early morning. At that time, there was only one belief in my heart, that if God did not permit me to die, I could even survive on my last breath. On August 2nd, the two policemen placed a black hood over my head, dragged me onto the police car, and took me to a small two-story building in the mountains. I saw the sister who had been arrested with me. We were kept in different rooms. The police guarded us 24 hours a day in three shifts. On the evening of August 3rd, the police started to interrogate me. They shocked me with electric batons and took turns punching and kicking me, torturing me for most of the night. During this period, the screams of the sister under torture continued to come from the next room. On the August 4th, I heard that the sister had almost died after trying to commit suicide by cutting her wrist because she could not bear the torture. I was grief stricken. I could only pray silently for her and ask God to give her strength. At night, two policemen beat me for three hours in turn. They tied a rough strip of cloth to the handcuffs fastened to my wrists on the heating pipe high above. My entire body was almost suspended in midair. The saw teeth of the handcuffs sank into my flesh. The blood vessels in my hands were bloated, like they were about to burst. I was covered with sweat from the pain. Then, in a while, the policeman loosened the cloth a bit and tightened it again in another while. The saw teeth of the handcuffs sank into my flesh time and again, cutting two bloody grooves on my wrists since I was swung back and forth like this for three hours. Afterward, they put me down. A policeman forcefully stuffed a bottle of mustard oil into my mouth. I almost suffocated from choking. Such torture persisted until two o'clock in the morning. On August 5th, I was sent to the detention center. At that time, my body was so riddled with wounds that I could barely walk. The police still came every two or three days to interrogate me. They continued to beat me brutally struck my fingers with a belt buckle, and jabbed my collarbone with their fingers, trying every possible way to make me give up my faith. I lived under a tense and terrifying atmosphere every day. As soon as the iron gate of the cell jangled, I would tremble involuntarily. The one month and 22 days in the detention center was even harsher than the five days under torture. One day in mid-September, the Gypsy City Public Security Bureau directly sentenced me to two years of re-education through labor on the trumped-up charges of disrupting social order, and then verbally informed my family. It was only at that moment when my family members learned that I had been arrested by the CCP. In September 2008, I was escorted to the women's labor camp in Helongjiang province. The police told the prisoners that I believed in Almighty God and often instructed the prisoners to abuse and beat me. I was forced to work for more than a dozen hours each day, and I had to be on night shift for three hours at night. It was not easy to pass each day safely there. I was only able to pray secretly to Almighty God in tears under the blanket, missing God's love. It was only the power I had received from God that kept me alive resiliently. In May 2010, I was released from prison. The police required me to report regularly to the local police station. They threatened that if I was found to believe in Almighty God again, I would be arrested and resentenced. In order to continue to believe in God, I was forced to flee from home. In 2016, under the wonderful orchestration and arrangement of God, I fled to the United States. Here, 
I finally didn't have to worry anymore about being arrested by the police for believing in God. I can boldly say that I believe in Almighty God and freely witness for Almighty God. I feel very happy and grateful. I also earnestly hope that more and more righteous people would pay attention to the facts of the persecution Christians of the Church of Almighty God are under. Help and protect them and give them a sky of religious freedom. Thank you. Before continuing this event, I would like to thank the panelists for their presentations which I hope allow you to enlighten the issue of the religious minorities persecution in China and the dramatic consequence of the tenure of the asylum in European countries. Thank you for your attention. is the basic policy, national policy of China. Uh, Chinese citizens uh, really can really choose and express their belief. It is protected by law. You can find it in Chinese constitution. Uh, I can give you some uh, statistics to prove my opinion. There are more than 100 million religious people in China and over uh, 5,000 and 500 religious groups conduct activities in China. China the Chinese government inputs 30 million yuan per year to build and repair religious places, uh, such as mosques, uh, temples, and uh, churches. So I think uh, it's convincing that uh, Religious freedom is protected in China. Uh, but, but however, Xie Jiao is uh, not thinking. Xie Jiao, uh, they distort the doctrine and make use of people's religious belief to carry out illegal activities. Chinese authority punishing these criminal, criminals according to law. And our purpose is to better protect normal activities and the right to religious belief. Uh, I believe in the world, there is no government could allow criminal crimes and the guide of religion. So uh, that's opinion. That's my opinion. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I miss it. Did you present yourself before? Uh, where, where are you? Please. Uh, I'm in the Chinese government. Okay. I'm from Beijing. Okay, thank you. So I will give the floor to Mr. Intervin to answer you. Thank you. I believe it's a, <clears throat> an important contribution eh? as uh, it was clarified by one of the speakers, but I want to clarify it myself. We do not pretend to give lessons to China. We uh, are very well aware that even in the West, uh, there are problems about religious liberty. Our institutions are not perfect, and particularly groups uh, labeled as cults have been uh, discriminated and persecuted uh, for many years in European countries, there is a debate even in the United States in these very days because television series are questioning why an incident such as the one in Waco, really the, the police handled the, the situation according to the law. So I, I don't believe uh, uh, we are in a position to say we are the good countries, some other countries, but that's completely uh, foreign 
to, to our attitude and certainly in my attitude. And uh, I'm very grateful to the Chinese authorities for having invited me twice in uh, 2017 and uh, also in previous years to China to discuss these issues with them. So I believe dialogue is, is very important. Uh, and so uh, we should make an effort to understand how the Chinese system operates uh, and what are the, 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 the reasons uh, behind the Chinese attitudes. On the other hand, uh, dialogue always goes both ways. So we listen uh, with respect to the position of the, the Chinese authorities, but when we were kindly invited to China, we also presented our different point of view. So uh, uh, I believe a key comment in, in your presentation is that CHA distort the doctrines. Now, distorting the doctrines uh, uh, in our uh, Western European uh, or American uh, uh, legal system is not a crime. And again, I say our system is not perfect. But distorting the doctrines cannot be, uh, in our opinion, be constructed of a crime because what is a distorted doctrine for one people is the truth for the next person. And so we uh, absolutely agree that people who commit crime, people who kill people, people who abuse women or children, they should be punished. Our concern, however, with your Article 300 of uh, Chinese Criminal Code and with the interpretation of Article 300 in January 2017 by the Chinese Supreme Court and the Chinese Supreme Procuratory is that in the definition of criminal activities by CHIAO, there are crimes such as spreading superstition or preaching false doctrines. And uh, that is uh, exactly uh, the point where we do not agree, because uh, how you define a superstition, how you define a true doctrine or a false doctrine, Again, what for me is a true doctrine, perhaps for you is a false doctrine. What for you is a true doctrine, perhaps for me is a false doctrine. So we should surely continue uh, this dialogue uh, and uh, as we try to, to understand uh, the rationale <coughs> for the, the Chinese attitudes against the Ejiao, and as I say, that I understand that dates back to the Ming period. It's not new. It's a constant in Chinese history. I believe the Chinese side should also try to understand the different points of view and the, the fact that uh, international convention uh, doesn't really allow for discriminating against uh, religious groups for what they believe false teaching, distorted teachings, uh, heterodox teaching. So, of course, uh, common crimes should be punished, uh, but nobody should be persecuted for simply believing something uh, uh, other people do not agree with. But again, uh, I thank you for your intervention, and I hope uh, that the dialogue can be continued during the next year. Uh, Chinese. Uh, uh, can you introduce yourself? Uh, so, you Sir, want... thank you. Uh, I'm a staff from Chinese Association for International Understanding. Um, just want to ask a question that um, have you ever gone to China and get some first hand materials about these cases that related to the Church of Almighty God? Why I ask this question because that, um, to be honest, um, there are too many rumors and uh, fake stories on the internet today all over the world, you know. Even though the stories are told by the people that uh, experienced uh, uh, the 
experienced uh, by, by himself, um, the story might not, not be the entire truth. And uh, mm, in the video, only the, the uh, adherents of Almighty God were interviewed, but uh, we, we didn't get any words from the Chinese officers and the police. And I think we should interview one side and should interview the other side. And that can give uh, us the entire truth. And I also noted that um, the, inter the interviewees uh, in the video, they dressed well, they looked uh, their skin, uh, they, uh, the color of their skin looked uh, light yellow. And they, uh, I mean, they looked, uh, uh, they were, uh, they are not working on the land, but uh, as, I, as I know that the, uh, that the many adherents in China um, the, of the Almighty God, then they are usually Chinese farmers. So I, I think that um, I suggest you uh, to prepare a trip to China and uh, go and see and uh, do some um, real investigations or surveys on the, on the issues that you talked about. Thank you for yeah. your kind question. That's exactly what we did. Here you see a report published by KK News, that's a government agency, about my trip to China. Yeah. I mean, I spent uh, eight days in Henan with the 610 office of the police. I was invited by the Chinese Anti-Cult Association with another three American uh, scholars, and we toured all Henan. Uh, we, unfortunately, we could not meet with actual members of the Church of Almighty God. That was not allowed by the Chinese authorities. But uh, in all the different cities we visited, uh, we met police officers uh, and we met former members of the Church of Almighty God, which had been reformed in labor camps uh, and uh, told them, uh, uh, told to us their stories. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, I did uh, my study of the Church of Almighty God uh, is uh, 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 particular of the crimes. Uh, ascribed to the Church of Almighty God is completely based on documents I received from Chinese authorities. I didn't receive any documents on the McDonald's murder, for instance, by the Church of Almighty God. They don't have any documents about it. It was done by a different group. All the, you can find there my article on the McDonald's murder, all the documents quoted there, documents I received from the Chinese authorities. So I thank you for your suggestion. It makes a lot of sense. And that's exactly what we did. We went to China, we interviewed police officers, we interviewed the former members of the Church of Almighty God. Some of them are reformed and today are members of the Communist Party. We interviewed the relatives of members of the Church of Almighty God who are members of the Chinese Communist Party and very much against the Church of Almighty God. Uh, you are perfectly right. That's what the home war scholars should do. And that's exactly what we did. But on the other hand, we also interviewed members of the Church of Almighty God in Korea, in Europe, in the United States. We would have loved to do this in China, but it's underground organization. We were not allowed. So I believe we did our homework. One of the results of our homework, and your last observation is very interesting, is that the reports in some early Chinese studies that the average member of the Church of Almighty God is a peasant, these reports are inaccurate. Uh, statistically, the majority of the members of the Church of Almighty God uh, are middle class. So it's not surprising that they don't look like peasants because they are not peasants. Uh, that was reported in some of the very early studies of the Church of Almighty God uh, written six, seven years ago. But uh, one of the interesting results of our studies, that's basically a mistake. Most members of the Church of Almighty God are uh, middle class. They are not farmers. Yeah.
I mean, next time, maybe you should put some officers' words in the video. And we look, we hear from different sides, and we can uh, totally know the entire truth uh, from both sides. That's very good, but of course, uh, uh, this is uh, an event presenting our point of view. When I went to an event in China, uh, you see the picture, that was an event in Zhenzhou about the Church of Almighty God. Uh, I saw videos by the government against the Church of Almighty God. I didn't see any video in favor of the Church of Almighty God. I was not scandalized, that's normal. I go to an event organized by the government in China for criticizing the Church of Almighty God. They don't expect that they offer me a point of view criticizing the government. So that's more or less normal. Maybe Rosita wants to say something? No, it's just, it just the, that, that is the paradox. Then you are invited in the, in the, in the Chinese, the Chinese government is inviting you, they give only their version. So it's strange that you are now surprised that this is like another version. But uh, the, ver the, the normal dealing is, is that everybody sits together and talks, but we cannot only expect that this our truth is right. The dialogue usually exposes parts of both sides in some ways, that there are some things, but the dialogue is the essential. And as the scholars, because Massimo talks not only about himself, but in the photo, for instance, you see uh, Gordon Melton, American, very known American scholar, who went to China, we don't know how many times. He spent years. And now he's, he has different opinions, and he is more on our side. So it's clearly, there are things that is, is to be discovered. It just saying that everything is fine is not enough, because the, 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 the facts, because when there is some accusation, it should be facts, but on the both sides, it's not only on one side. We cannot expect only the, 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 the members of Almighty God to, to provide some, some proofs. I saw, me personally, I saw the, the people who are suffering from the traumas of the, of, the, of, the, of the torture. I saw myself. And they're seeking healing because that is people, they're damaged. And it's not, it's not coming just like this because they just decided to be bad people. So it's, it's really complicated. It's on the both sides, it's complicated. And, uh, and it's dialogue, as you say, is the best thing to do. Uh, just okay. I thank you, Mr. Flau, just to, uh, to, to be very understand that this side event is not a criticized, it's not an attack, it's a, uh, the way uh, to open the dialogues. And we are uh, here to open the dialogue and to, to find a solution. So now I give you the floor. Okay. Uh, sir, as I know, uh, the Chinese Jewish officers, including policemen, uh, prosecutors, and judges, they will be responsible for their duty behaviors for life according to their law. Uh, so, uh, if if they were found to have any wrongdoings, even when they retire, they will be published by the law. So it obvious that they will uh, not do illegal things such as torture their criminal suspect, uh, beat them, or uh, be rude to their suspect relatives. Um, so I don't know the source of their video, but uh, for me, I. I think it's hard to be ill. Yes, this is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. I, that gives me the opportunity to, to insist on the dialogue. Here you see this man is Professor Gordon Melton. He's a very well-known scholar from Baylor University in Texas. And he, as lecturer at Security University, the University of the Police in Beijing, discussing the Church of Almighty God. He's uh, going to the United States for training and discussion. Now, uh, of course, there are in China laws against uh, torture. I'm an Italian. Uh, there are these laws also in Italy. But uh, recently, six policemen were sentenced to heavy jail penalties in Italy for torturing suspects. So it happens all over the world. Of course, there are laws against uh, torture and abuse, but torture and abuse may happen. It happens in the United States. It happens in Europe. 
uh, I uh, will not exclude that it may happen also in, uh, in China. Again, uh, it's important that you understand that we are not here uh, to distinguish between good countries and bad countries. So, uh, these abuses also exist in the United States and in Europe, but uh, we uh, listen to evidence uh, to people who claim to have been uh, tortured in China and we believe their voices deserve to be heard. As for the laws, that's exactly the problem. And that's what makes this dialogue uh, fruitful and interesting. Uh, of course, the members of the Church of Almighty God are prosecuted uh, according to the law, but most of them are sentenced, and there are documents uh, about it. Uh, they are sentenced under Article 300 of the Chinese Criminal Code, and uh, we believe that Article 300 uh, uh, is wrong. Uh, it, it's a law uh, incriminating uh, uh, activities on behalf of certain religions labeled the CHR. And it's interesting if you study Article 300, for instance, there is a study by Professor James Richardson. He's an eminent uh, scholar of law and that it is an eminent scholar of law has been recognized by the Chinese authorities. They have invited him repeatedly to lecture in China, including in the security university in Beijing. And he studied Article 300 and concluded Article 300 punishes people simply for being active or doing missionary activities on behalf of certain religions or cults, okay, CHR. And that's something we do not agree with. Again, if people steal, murder, abuse children, abuse women, uh, they should be punished. But if people simply say, uh, we believe that a certain woman is a mighty God, or we believe in UFOs, uh, that should be free. Nobody should be punished because of his or her belief. We understand that's a cultural difference, that the CA Zhao legislation exists in China since the 18th century. It's not been invented by recent authorities. But that's a point of disagreement we should uh, frankly and sincerely uh, discuss. Um, I just would like to, to, to underline that this meeting is not about uh, is proving or, or, or discussing about the torture. Torture is, is one of the persecution's elements. Because if you see the, the, the title of the, of the event, as clearly said, is religious freedom and then to call persecution in China. Because there is, first, there is intolerance, there is discrimination, there is persecution, and then it might be torture. So it's, we are not trying to prove that we are really the gods that we know and that we have made it. It's, it will be too much. What we're discussing here, we're discussing persecution. And persecution, I believe, it's clearly the, the, the law, the, the list of the, of, the, of, the, of the groups that they are listing child. So it's, it's, it's clear there is a persecution. That's all we say. The rest is not, it's not, it's not up to us because torture is a very serious crime. And it's different, uh, it's, it's covered by, by the Convention on Persecution, and there are different mechanisms to do it. It's not that's what we do here. Here is a different, it's a very simple thing. We try to say and to prove with the arguments that, 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 that the members of the, of the Church of Almighty God, they are persecuted or are discriminated against it. It's, it's, it's higher, it's persecution. So they cannot freely express their beliefs in China. That's it. So that's a very simple, very simple conclusion. They cannot, and you perhaps you will agree that they cannot, because the, the Chinese government is perceiving them as something bad. That's I believe the, the mainly the, the meeting is about it, and we should stay in the in the in the frame of this without going really that far and uh, and have a very very difficult discussion that we are not entitled to have. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the the adherent of Almighty uh, God um, um, do to the public, to the Chinese public on Earth? 
uh, because I know they are involved in many um, issues of uh, a crime like uh, fraud and uh, and uh, suicide. Uh, and um, I think um, there are a few words about this uh, crime. I think uh, I want you to tell, tell me more about this. Yes. Uh... As I said, we were invited to China for a week-long tour of uh, Henan, uh, talking with police officers, some of them quite high-placed police officers. And after we went to Henan, we digested the, the material we collected in Henan in June 2017. We were invited for a second seminar in September in Hong Kong. Uh, again, with high-placed Chinese police officers in charge of dealing with Xie Zhao, the so-called of, uh, Office 610, came to his conference. So, crimes. That is what is very interesting. I mean, I have studied the violence connected to religion for 30 years. So, we asked the, the Chinese side, the police, to provide the documents about these crimes. And uh, we were provided with a number of documents uh, on some crimes. On other crimes, we were told there are no documents, because we are too old, the, the documents have disappeared, or all the procedure was not done in private. So, very shortly, uh, there are four main incidents we have received documents about. <coughs> Number one, the McDonald's murder. In 2014 in South Juan, you will find my study on the table. It was a different group, who used the name Almighty God, but recognized a different Almighty God. Not the same person this group recognizes as Almighty God. Number two, there was the case of a boy whose eyes were gouged out in Shanxi and uh, documents, again, documents from Chinese sources, because Almighty God said we have nothing to do, so they don't have documents about it, were studied by another scholar who was invited to both uh, trips to China, Professor Holly Fogg, uh, she teaches in Washington State in the US. Again, you find there an article she wrote, uh, and the Chinese police, closed the investigation by saying the, the boy's eyes were gouged out uh, by the boy's aunt, who later committed suicide. She's not a member of the Church of Almighty God. And only after one year, after the McDonald's case, some Chinese media started uh, involving the Church of Almighty God. But that's not what the documents say. Case number three. Riots in 2012 about the prediction of uh, uh, the end of the world in 2012. Uh, yes, there were riots in China. Yes, many Chinese uh, believe the so-called Maya prophecy uh, that uh, the, the, the world will end in 2012. Uh, perhaps in these riots there were some members of the Church of Almighty God, but uh, uh, the Church of Almighty God, as an organization, issued documents that uh, this belief was false. And that makes sense, as I know the theology of the Church of Almighty God, they studied it uh, quite uh, in depth. The Church of Almighty God does not believe in the end of the world. In 2012 or in any other day, it believes the world will be transformed in a better world, but uh, will not be destroyed. And also they believe uh, that the, this transformation of the world can only take place uh, after the person they recognize as a mighty God will have completely this mission. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Ru uh, mentioned it, uh, uh, even uh, Emily Dutt, she's an Australian scholar, she doesn't like the Church of Almighty God, but in her book about the Church of Almighty God, she clarifies that those members who uh, spread the 1012 prophecies uh, were uh, uh, disapproved by the leaders of the Church of Almighty God. Some of them were excommunicated. 
were expelled. Uh, number four, uh, in 2002, 16 years ago, uh, some pastors of a Christian church called the China Gospel Fellowship claimed to have been kidnapped by Church of Almighty God for purposes of conversion. Uh, here the case is very interesting because the Chinese authorities never open an investigation. There is no police investigation. There is no court case. And uh, we have to believe uh, these pastors and the uh, lay leaders of the China Gospel Fellowship, but their story is very not persuasive. And again, you will find an issue of a scholarly journal with an article I wrote based on the existing documents, which are not police documents, because police never investigate this case, are documents by this Christian group, and these documents uh, are not very convincing. Very good for a novel, actually two novels were written in this case, but novels are one case and the reality is, is something different. I know there are other accusations, you can find them even in Wikipedia very easily, but about these other two, three incidents, which are very old, they back to 20 years ago, I asked personally the Chinese authorities to provide documents, and uh, they told me there are no documents left, so I cannot say anything <coughs> uh, fall under the category of rumors, because when there are no documents, they are rumors, they are not facts. Thank you for your answer. Yes, uh, as a note about accusations to Church of Almighty God or any other church, we go back about 2018 years ago. I don't know if you or any of us know a bit of story on this. Christians in general were accused of anything and everything. They were crucified. They were thrown to lions. This happened. Does it mean that the accusations were true? It doesn't mean that. Maybe some were true, some were not, and some were fabricated by uh, people within the governments. Doesn't mean a government cannot be good or bad. The government is a government, and there is people inside who act wrong or right. Okay? Now, I belong to a religion which in 19, uh, 1990, more or less, we were accused of being guilty of the death of dictator Franco in Spain because my church had a ship, uh, an American ship, uh, sailing through the Mediterranean coast. Now, the charge of a prosecu state prosecutor, he wrote, was, this was not the media, this was not a person who didn't like the church, no, no, it was a prosecutor, an official, he wrote in page number two of a writ of accusation, an official accusation, that the members, that the crew of this ship were intimately related to the death of dictator Franco, the revolution of the flowers in Portugal, and the state push in Morocco, okay? We were accused of that for over 20 years, right? We never did that, and if we did that, we should have a statute for this, okay? Not an accusation. Now, that a, that a specific group is accused of something is not a, a valid reason to persecute them, is not a valid reason to discriminate them, because there is there is one of the human rights which says you are innocent until proven guilty and you have the right to a fair trial. Thank you. Yes, and it's uh, time to finish. Now we go over uh, more than 40 minutes. So that's very good to have this question, this, uh, this change because it, it shows the purpose of this side event, which is dialogue. And uh, for sure, after, uh, we can continue this dialogue, so thank you.